Uh, so to our second panel, um, what we're asking here is the why question, as Aaron put it, um, why um, this initiative and why innovation? There is really no one better on the planet, I have to say, to answer this precise question than Clay Christensen. This is someone who introduced the idea of disruptive innovation uh, uh, a few decades ago and has persistently then applied this theory across a number of domains, um, generally in business, uh, a fine book on healthcare along the way, and most recently, this year, in fact, um, training his sights on the university itself, looking at the challenges that we see, the uh, rising prices, of course, of education, some of the challenges from technology, such as online learning and so forth, um, but putting in the context of our own domain this question of innovation. Um, Clay Christensen is the Kim B. Clark uh, Professor of Business Administration at the Business School um, and is in that category of needing no introduction. Professor Christensen. Honored to be able to uh, spend this time with you. Uh, since I became an academic, it's been now 20 years, I've been focused on the, the question of why is it that success is so hard to sustain? If you look across the sweep of business history, most companies, which at one point were widely regarded as unassailably successful, a decade or two later, you find them in the middle of the pack and often at the bottom of the heap. And uh, the strangest conclusion that we got from that is that what causes successful companies unable to sustain their success is they follow the principles of good management that we teach at the Harvard Business School. <laughs> and, and that's actually true. But a, a way to visualize it is that almost never does the leader get killed by somebody who jumps ahead of them to develop better products that they could sell for better profits to the best customers of the leader. You almost never kill them by doing it better. But rather what kills the leaders is somebody comes in at the bottom of the market with a simple, affordable product in undemanding applications, and then it moves up. And that's what kills the leaders. And the reason, why, the reason is, let me describe it in what is it that killed General Motors and Ford. Um, it's Toyota came in, not with a Lexus, but if you remember, they came in with a rusty little subcompact called a Corona in the 1960s. And then they went from a Corona to Tercel, Corolla, Camry, Avalon, Forerunner, Sequoia, and then the Lexus. And General Motors was up here making big cars for big people. And they'd look down at Toyota coming after them, and occasionally they'd say, you know, we ought to go get those buggers. And they'd send down a Chevette or a Pinto. <laughs> <laughs> but then they would compare the profitability of a little subcompact with the profitability from making bigger SUVs and bigger uh, pickup trucks for bigger people. It just made no sense to defend the least profitable part of the business when they, when they could do that. And in fact, when they lopped off the lowest profit part of the product line and added up the remaining numbers, their profitability improved as they got out of the low end. And then Toyota, the way they improve their profitability is they keep moose, you know. Uh, who's killing Toyota today? They don't feel as if they're getting killed, incidentally. It's the Koreans at the low end. But why would Toyota defend the least, profitable part of the, the least profitable part of the business when they have the privilege of competing with Mercedes at the high end? And so that's the way it always works. And the second thing about it is that usually these people at the low end are very often not customers of the mainstream people. So um, those of you with a bit of gray hair might remember that through the mid-1970s, the dominant companies in consumer electronics were companies called RCA, Westinghouse, General Electric, Z uh, Zenith, and so on. And they didn't kill one another, but a crummy little Japanese company called Sony came in to the bottom of the market with a different technology, uh, transistors, rather than the vacuum tubes that were used in the mainstream. And all of the existing 
vacuum tube companies. They saw the transistor coming, but it couldn't handle the power required to make to be used in the televisions that RCA made in the 70s and or 60s and 70s. And so they worked on the technology, trying to make it good enough to be used in the market. What Sony did in, in, instead was rather than forcing this new technology to compete head on against the old technology, rather than, they made it so much more affordable and accessible that a whole new population of people could now home, own electronic uh, radios and televisions kind of the low end of humanity that we call today teenagers. <laughs> and I remember when, uh, when so, uh, Sony introduced their little pocket radio, cost two bucks. My brother and I put in a, our whole savings, each one a dollar, bought this little thing, and we had to, I was raised in Salt Lake City, we had to face west to the Great Salt Lake to get reception. <laughs> but. It was infinitely better than nothing, which was our other alternative. And so we were delighted with a product that wasn't very good. Had Sony tried to sell their little radio to my parents, who had a nice uh, RCA in the dining room, it would have been judged as crummy, because it truly was. But then Solid State Electronics, practiced by Sony, got better and better and better and better. And little by little, it got good enough that customers who previously had to buy the vacuum tube products said, geez, not only is it the same, but I could take this pocket radio with me anywhere. And step by step, they just sucked customers from the back in, into this new one. And suddenly, RCA had no customers and things. And that's just the way it always works in, in my study of what kills the leaders. If somebody stumbles in with a simple, affordable product in, in undemanding applications, a different set of customers who would, um, didn't have enough money to buy the traditional thing, now it was better than nothing, and so on. So a student a number of years ago, uh, I teach my class inviting the students, you've got to give me anomalies that the theory doesn't ex 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 can't, can't explain. And he said, doesn't happen in hotels. And it took me about five years. To, he, he was right. So Holiday Inn came in in the 50s with low price hotels, but they didn't move up market and to, distrib to, dis to displace um, Marriott. And uh, McDonald's came in at the low end and they didn't move up. So what's going on? And it took me about five years to figure this out. But the explanation was that this actually doesn't happen in some industries. In other words, in these, people come in at the bottom, and you, can, you see why the more expensive ones don't go down to kill those guys, but these guys can't go up. The ones where disruption happens it's there's something about their business model or the technology that is extendable up market to make more and more sophisticated products with that core. And so the reason why the personal computer killed digital equipment and the mainframe computers was the microprocessor was extendable up market. And the reason why S S Sony killed RCA was the transistor was extendable up market. And Toyota did it because the frame technology was extendable up market. But in the hotels, there was no techno, no techno core that would, could be, um, extend up market. So if uh, the Holiday Inn wants to move up to a higher price point, they had to hire a concierge just like Four Seasons has a concierge. And so they could go up market, but every time they moved up to emulate the companies that they were to, wanted to compete against, they had to replicate their cost position. They didn't disrupt them with something that was fundamentally lower cost or, or um, more accessible. 
Um, and that's why, they, and, and that's why um, McDonald's hasn't moved up market to disrupt the Four Seasons. So this helped me understand why in higher education there really hasn't been historically disruption going on. Most of the folks that list were around 50 years ago are still around today. There are more of them, so there's more competition, but they haven't been disrupted because there has not been a technological core. So you start a two-year school, um, the minute they open the doors, they want to become a four-year school. And the minute they do that, they want to offer more uh, majors, and then they want to offer master's degrees and so on. And everybody wants to move up the Carnegie ladder to move from second to th third to second to first tier. But in, in doing so, they have had to replicate the business model of a Harvard. There wasn't anything technological extendable that would allow them to take a low-cost model up until online learning. And I believe now that online learning is this technological core, and therefore an industry, higher ed, which in the past was not vulnerable to disruption, I believe is truly now vulnerable. And I'd like to just tell one story and then draw on a, another theory of our work that says, guys, watch out. Now, so you know where I'm coming from. My wife says that I am the Jewish mother of business <laughs> because I am always worried about everybody. It doesn't matter how well their things are going. So <laughs> that's who I am. So about six months ago, I got a visit from the dean of the University of uh, Phoenix, a business school. And uh, he said, you know, we've watched your stuff. We've listened to you. We want to record your 10 best lectures. And I didn't dismiss them because, in my experience, the people who are at the bottom today are often the leaders tomorrow. And so I want to understand how these guys think. And so I went to talk to the dean, uh, Dean Light, at the time. And he was just incredulous. But he, he said, look. We don't compete against the University of Phoenix, and so if you want to pr prostitute your brand by doing this with the University of Phoenix, have at it. And I thought I don't have a, a brand to put at risk anyway, so. so, but the rules are you can't record clay at Harvard. So these guys went downtown and, and uh, rented this beautiful auditorium in the Institute for Contemporary Art. And when I'm looking out, there's this band, a bay window behind us, and you can see the whole harbor. It is a beautiful building. And they said, so uh, we'll bring about 50 or so uh, people in the audience so you don't have to give this to an empty room. <laughs> so I show up with my PowerPoint about 10 minutes before, you know, and I'm getting it up, and I looked at the audience. Oh my gosh, these were beautiful people. <laughs> Truly beautiful people. And so I went out and asked one of them, uh, what school do you guys go to? And he said, oh, we're not students, we're models. <laughs> and it, instantly I knew what was going on. And they know that Clay's going to get boring on occasion. And when he does, we need to pan the audience. <laughs> And we need people who can pretend that this is interesting. And furthermore, we know that the average um, student at the University of Phoenix is 36 years old. Uh, and they would love to look like these people, right? So anyway, I did my best. Two we or three weeks later, the dean came to see me again, very excited. He said, Clay, have you ever seen Clay Christensen teach? And I said, actually, never. And he said, watch. I'm not kidding. Clay Christensen is unbelievable. <laughs> In the whole thing, there wasn't a single wasted word. And it wasn't just Clay, but it wasn't just my PowerPoint. It was three-dimensional, animated. 
when I reached how Toyota moved up into, or Toyota went up into the uh, Lexus to compete in, Lex, in, in the luxury, you heard the, the uh, music in the background crescendo. <laughs> I am not kidding you. Clay Christensen is fantastic. <laughs> so I said, um, so how many of your students are you going to show this to? And he said, well, right now we're thinking we'll show it to all 135,000 of our full-time MBA students. And I said, oh. <laughs> uh, I thought like HBS was one of the two biggest schools in America when we put in 900 a year. And he said, I know. I bet you if you go back in your, your past, there was a concept that's kind of dropped out now called scale. <laughs> Have you ever heard of it? And uh, anyway, um, in fact, they are spending $200 million every year trying to teach, make teaching better. Not creating new courses, but make the existing paces better. Um, anyway, so that's one story. And then very quickly, another thing that I worry about is that there are two different, fundamentally different types of architectures in products or services. One we would call an interdependent architecture. It's like uh, windows where the design of every piece depends upon the design of every, of the, uh, every other piece. So you have to do everything in order to do anything because the design of each depends upon the, the design of everybody else. The other way to do it is like in Linux or a Dell computer modular, where the way the pieces together all snap together according to standards. Historically, the architecture in higher ed has been an interdependent architecture. You can't take this unless you took that from that professor. And I understand that you took that at UMass Amherst when you went with those guys to semester abroad at wherever. But I don't think, I don't think it's as good as this, and so you can't take that. We, we won't recognize it. And because of the interdependence, we have to offer everything in order to, to offer anything. And, and it's really complicated if we want to try to insert one course instead of another course because of the interdependence. And what that means is these people that we don't like a lot who come occasionally to give us accreditation, they have to accredit the whole university because none of the pieces can be in independently. I had a stroke and I don't say the word sometimes. Accredited, is that the right word? But I noticed the last time I was to see my family in Salt Lake City, <coughs> going from Salt Lake to Provo, there were four new universities just in some office building with the name on the outside, names of new universities that I haven't seen before. And I understand why they're there. And that is, if I want to start a new university and I want to emu emulate the traditional university, boy, that's a, a high barrier to entry because I have to do everything in order to do anything. But if I'm doing an online university, I think I'll go modular. In fact, remember uh, MIT a couple of years, uh, we weeks ago said, we'll actually offer not, not our material online, but our courses online, and we'll give you a certification that you've took the course, passed the exam, which means you've um, met what, they're, what they say are the, the capabilities in that, and, uh, and we'll give you this certificate. And so if I'm going to start a university, I think, you know, rather than hire somebody to teach entry-level physics, let me just do Richard Levins from MIT. He's, he's offered this one to five million people already. I don't think we could do better than that.
And then Accounting 101, there's a guy at BYU. Actually, Harvard Business School has their students take that course rather than offering it together, you know. And step by step, without ever needing to hire any faculty, he can actually offer the best classes offered in America by the best teachers. And uh, I bet what happens there is accreditation occurs not at the level of the university, but at the course. And that means that the barrier for having lots of universities come in is a very different thing in the future than historically has been in the past. So uh, that's what I worry about. And that's the reason why I think we ought to be really scared stiff about innovation. <laughs>